<laughs> so thank you everyone again for coming out uh, on this steamy August day. Uh, I guarantee you will not be disappointed. Um, at this point, I want to turn the program over to Sarah to open up and talk to us a little bit about the significance and importance of data as a tool for racial justice. So, Sarah? All right. Uh, thanks so much, Valerie. Thanks, everyone, for having me here. I'm looking forward to getting to know everyone. Um, I don't know most of you, but I do know your organizations. You rely on your work a lot at CLU, so I'm looking forward to that. So as Valerie said, my name is Sarah Jimenez. I work with Community Labor United in Boston. I'm a senior researcher there. Um, CLU convenes labor and community-based organizations. With those coalitions, we drive issue campaigns. And um, our value add to the coalitions that we convene is uh, to facilitate, to provide research and policy development support, and to direct legal and communications resources. So that's the intro done. Um, <laughs> is everyone having a good summer? <laughs> OK, great. I, um, earlier this summer, I was up in Maine. I was watching my sister walk across the stage. And as she walked, the audience was quiet. We were listening. The MC read several lines of her work. And then we clapped. That's the tradition for her program in creative writing. So she has a degree in creative writing. And I have a sister with a degree in creative writing, which is great, because I've been picking her brain on storytelling for a few years now. Um, and that's important, because storytelling is really essential to the research and the campaign work that Clue does. So here's a story. How many people here um, study childcare? OK, great. So most of you are new to it. And you can tell me later if the story made any sense to you. The story begins with two announcements. Back in April, there was a press release out of the Massachusetts EEC, which is our State Department of Early Education and Care. They're launching a new program. It's called Strong Start. Both words capitalized, smushed into one word. EEC has been overhauling its QRIS, or its Quality Ratings and Improvement System. And Strong Start is a major part of that. A lot of states have similar QRIS systems. They're specific to early education and child care. Typically, it's a rating scale for child care programs. And then there are resources to help programs move up in the rating scale. The EEC is very excited about this. They even said that word excited in their press release. So as for the second announcement, I can't tell you when it was made. Because in our state, child care advocates waited and waited and waited for this announcement, and it never came. A few years ago, to everyone's surprise, federal block grant funding for child care nearly doubled. It was discretionary, so it might have only been temporary. But almost immediately, there were statements from all these different states about how they would spend it. So what is Governor Baker doing with the 58 million that our state got? He's not saying. But in this case, no message is the message. All these other states, they were happy to share their plans because it made them look good. They were going to fund more vouchers for low-income families. And they were going to raise reimbursement rates for care providers and so on. Those are things that our state sorely needs, too with some of the highest child care costs in the nation and some of the lowest care provider rates. But if the, big, if the Baker administration were going to do something about that, we bet they would have said so. So let me introduce you now to someone who didn't notice either one of those announcements or non-announcements. Her name is Rosanna. Rosanna lives outside Codman Square in Boston. And one day in the square, there's a woman with flyers. Hospitality training, the flyers read. Most hotels in Boston are union, and the wages are decent. In fact, Rosanna vaguely remembers seeing hordes of red t-shirts marching around the city recently, shouting something that seemed both common sense and also totally utopian. One job should be enough. So Rosanna turns to her friend Ava, who's also a mother, and pushes the flyer at her. Let's go in together, she says. Ava looks at it, but she's not smiling. I know this program, she said. They said that first year hotel workers get the graveyard shifts. And we need to have overnight childcare in place before we even start this program. So Rosanna wonders briefly if her mom could come overnight to watch little Joselito. And then just as quickly, she dismisses the idea because her mother hasn't been well. And how can she take care of someone when she needs someone at home taking care of her? So Rosanna stuffs the flyer into her handbag. And that's where it'll stay until the next time she empties the whole thing out to clean. The flyer is still in there that evening when she's home. And she's trying to enjoy a few hours with her husband before he leaves for the night shift. And I say trying because she's struggling not to be upset that he overdrafted their account. And he's struggling not to be upset that she didn't fill up the gas tank before she got home. 
It's like this a lot of nights. They try not to fight because their apartment is small and little Joselito would be able to hear them through the walls. Uh, Community Labor United was paying close attention to these two announcements. At Clue, we've been doing research for our coalition on childcare for about two years now. The coalition finally has a name, Care That Works, and we've made progress on our issue analysis, which helped us to interpret those two announcements probably a little bit differently from most people. So what kind of research is happening? The word radical means relating to the root of something. Radical change means getting to the root of a problem or a system. To target root level change, you need to start with a root cause analysis. Um, and for big unwieldy systems like childcare, those roots usually go way back in history. So research is the foundation of all of our campaigns and it's never complete without looking at our histories. We look at the events, we look at the statistics, and we try to make sense of them and turn them into stories. Rosanna probably doesn't think about this often, but in 1935, when her grandmother was still a young girl, a bill was passed called the National Labor Relations Act. People probably know about this one. When our country moved to protect the welfare of workers, a huge population of workers were deliberately left out of it. This included domestic workers, and that includes childcare workers employed in private homes, largely poor women of color, and their being left out was not an accident. In 1946, when Rosanna's grandmother was a teenager, the federal government ended its first and last ever universal childcare program. The war was over, the men were coming back, and the woman who had been working had to go home. And with women at home, no more need for government-funded childcare. Decades later, after Rosanna's mother had been born, there was another stab at universal childcare. In 1972, the Comprehensive Child Development Bill passed the House and it passed the Senate, and then it died on President Nixon's desk. Two, day, two decades later, in the late 80s, all we got instead was this block grant, the Child Care Development Block Grant. So in the mid-90s, when Rosanna was in the first grade, we got welfare reform, and with it, work requirements, which were very popular because people didn't like the visual image of poor mothers of color staying at home with their children and receiving help. The childcare system we have today has its roots in all of these historical moments. With hindsight, we see these decisions justified with convoluted and contradictory logics, the logics of white supremacy, of patriarchy and misogyny and class prejudice. These forces still shape our world today and are poised to shape our future. So we need to know this history and we need to tell it. And we can't do that without the historical data. When we look at the landscape of our childcare today, the disaggregated data helps us trace the legacies of our history to our current circumstances. Given Clue's model of bridging community and labor organizations, when it comes to childcare, we focus on both families and care providers. This is especially important because when there isn't enough money in the system, these two groups are so easily pitted against one another. So take Rosanna. Her son, Joselito, is two years old. Like most other families, Rosanna relies on a multitude of arrangements to care for him. She uses family friend and neighbor care, an arrangement which is heavily used by families across race, ethnicity, and income. Uh, she wouldn't be able to access a childcare center probably without a voucher, especially not for the rates for infants and toddlers, and she definitely wouldn't be able to afford a full-time nanny. But sometimes she does rely on family childcare providers, who in our state are disproportionately women of color, especially older women of color. Unfortunately, these family childcare providers have been going out of business recently. Their numbers have been falling steadily in our state over the last decade. The childcare landscape is so, so fragmented and so segregated. This aggregated data has helped us see in particular how women of different races and incomes uh, are sorted into different care settings, both as parents and as care workers. Low-income women of color struggle to find care that they can afford during the hours that they need it, and care providers have some of the lowest wages in our state despite increasing credentialing requirements. So who remembers what those two announcements were? There was um, the one that the state was going all in on quality measurement, training, and credentialing. And then there is the one that was mum on the latest opportunity to help families afford care and increase care provider compensation. And Clue's analysis in a very abbreviated form is this, that policy priorities are ignoring the childcare challenges of low-income families of color by focusing almost exclusively on education metrics rather than basic access. That policy implementation is driving vulnerable caregivers out of the system by ramping up credential requirements without sufficient compensation. And that policy frameworks overall are ignoring the role of family stability in child development, ignoring the need for childcare to be a genuine work support so that parents can be at their best for their kids. 
And then that framework only reinforces the focus on education metrics and credentialing because then the caregivers and early educators become the scapegoats for poor child development outcomes. So by the way, Rosanna and Ava entered the hospitality training program after all. A pilot program was launched in Boston. It organized single mothers to go through these training programs together with a firm job opportunity at the end. And it organized family child care providers to work together to figure out how to offer care for non-standard schedules. Because Ava had been a prospective trainee before, the hospitality training program had reached back out to her when this new child care program was launched, and she pulled Rosanna in too. So as part of this program, Rosanna and Ava were invited to a special event. Other women in their cohort were there. The care providers were there too, including the ones who were caring for Rosanna and Ava's children. There was music and food and socializing and also history and statistics. This is the kind of gathering that Community Labor United organizes to engage our partner members in coalition work. Clue uses conversations, co-learning, and creative curricula to share the stories that we learned from our research, the stories about the past and the stories about what's happening today. So now Rosanna and Ava and their care providers are in a room together. And maybe they never realized before how they had absorbed the message that life is hard because of their unworthiness or their bad decisions or their random misfortune. But now they see themselves and their own lives reflected in the numbers and the stories, and they're starting to get the idea that they aren't alone. This kind of gathering is a key space for power building. Making change at the root level takes power, enough power to challenge the existing power structure that has control over so much of our daily lives, and enough power to ultimately wrestle that control back from those who hold it. So a lot of groups run issue campaigns and advocate for progressive change. What makes Clue different is our emphasis on power building, specifically the grassroots power of those who are most affected, like Rosanna and Ava and sharing information in all directions, including all those histories and statistics, uh, is a key way to start activating that power. This kind of gathering is also a key space for campaign development. Through our own research, you know, guided by the leaders in our coalition, we can develop ideas and options for campaigns. But without the grassroots members, there is no campaign, so the ultimate direction needs to come from them. Clue hasn't finished this process for our Care That Works Coalition yet, so there isn't a clear campaign that I can share with you today, but I can share two currents of interest. First of all, the program that Rosanna and Ava found is something that we're working on developing now. It's called the Independent Women Project, where we want to model the provision of licensed childcare for families with non-standard schedules. Um, it's something that can meet our people where they're at, it addresses an immediate need, and it's a vehicle for organizing. And down the road, if the model is successful, it can be a tool for our campaigns to shift care policy at the state level. So if we can show them that we're doing it, they can't say that it can't be done or that it can only be done with for-profit corporate partners. Relatedly, we want to revive the framing of childcare as a work support and as a public good. Right now, the policy landscape is dominated by the frame of childcare as an educational setting, which it is, but it is so much more than that too. And establishing a system of care that works, there you go, it's going to take more than just a QRIS overhaul. Another reason for this framing is that we know that corporations are the beneficiaries of the unfair scheduling policies and the low wages that make it hard for families to juggle work and care or to afford care at all. And big corporations are the beneficiaries of the low taxes that diminish the public revenue that could fill in the gap between what families can afford and what care providers should be earning. So we want to push this framing of childcare as the work support and a public good to therefore push the idea that big corporations as employers and taxpayers should be accountable for childcare too, and that they need to pony up. So there's, there's so much more in our campaign to be said, but I wanna save some time for the takeaways. Um, the, prompt, the prompt for this introduction, by the way, was how do we use data in our campaigns? So it's in there, but in case you missed it, I, have, I took them and made bullet points. We use data to help us understand an, an issue for the perspective of frontline communities and to develop a root cause analysis that will point us towards the kind of root level change that we want to move. And that research involves tracing historical conditions up to today, um, including systems shaping injustices in our past. That same historical research can also inform our campaign strategy by suggesting targets. So that is, the groups and the organizations that have benefited from injustice are likely to stand in our way if we move to change things. 
We use data to critique existing policy priorities and to shape our own policy agenda so that the interests of frontline communities that are usually ignored will be pushed to the front and center. We use data to support information sharing, organizing, and leadership development with the members of our partners so that we can build grassroots power that will confront existing power for control over our lives. I'll add that when we're in active campaign mode, we deploy data strategically to advance our vision, our values, and narrative, and to influence the public and other decision makers and targets. So that's probably the most visible and well-known use for data in campaigning. And um, one last takeaway is that you know, root level change is a major proposition and no one organization or one coalition is gonna do it by themselves. So we all have a role. And my organization's role is to take existing research that's out there and turn it into stories that people can move. So that means that we rely heavily on all of you, all the policy shops, to analyze that data and make it available. So thank you for your role and thank you for listening. <laughs> Part two. <I'll> talk about <laughs> it. <laughs> so thank you, Sarah, for sharing that story. And I just want to remind you, one of the ongoing themes of these workshops is making our research more useful and more practical to folks that are actually moving campaigns and trying to influence policy in their local areas. And the Center for Popular Democracy is one of the co-hosting organizations for this workshop series. So thank you, Sarah, for being a, a part of that. And I hope that you will keep some of those things in mind as we go through the day and get towards the second half of our uh, program today as we begin to think about you know, how we can, what, what kinds of information would be useful in terms of helping them to move uh, campaigns like the one that Sarah has mentioned. Uh, we will have time for Q&A after we break for lunch. So if you have questions, jot them down. We'll get back to those. At this point, I want to turn the program over to Trevon Logan, who's going to talk to us about race and ethnicity in empirical analysis. So thank you. I'm uh, excited to be here to talk about um, what may seem like a boring topic, but to a historian is actually quite exciting. Um, so to give a brief uh, outline of what we're going to talk about today, it, it occurred to me um, when Valerie and I were talking about this particular presentation that many people as secondary data users use race a lot in um, the data that they use, but they don't necessarily know how race is coded or changed over time. So we're going to start with some terms and definitions, um, which themselves are very interesting, and uh, we'll talk about why they have changed uh, so dramatically over time. And then we'll talk about how they become variables in analysis, in the analysis that we, we do with some very um, simple um, examples. I'm not going to teach uh, any econometrics today, I, I guarantee you. Um, and then talk about how we interpret that data and also with some examples, particularly from uh, social media, and then thinking about the meaning of race itself uh, in empirical uh, research. And so some of these in the last two um, are blurred uh, together because there's a lot of discussion about race and ethnicity today in particular in the United States. And the data that we use to talk about it um, itself um, is not always something that is um, as organized as we might believe. So some definitions. Um, there are racial classifications that come from uh, the US uh, Census, but more um, specifically, they come from the um, Office of Management and Budget, and they are uh, requirements. So these racial classifications are the following. They're white, black, or African American, Asian, Native American, uh, American Indian or Alaska Native, um, Native Hawaiian or other uh, Pacific Islander, and then there is another category of some other uh, race, and I'll talk about that in a moment. And there are also two ethnicity classifications, um, Hispanic and non-Hispanic. And so everyone is a member of both a race and ethnicity. Um, and usually when we're talking about some of these, there are some groupings um, that people use canonically as races, um, but which actually are not. I'll talk about that in a second. So how are these uh, races defined and where do they come from in, in terms of uh, policy? Um, the Office of Management and Budget requires that race data be collected for a minimum of five groups, okay? White, Black or African American, American Indian or Alaska Native, Asian, and Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander. 
they permit the Census Bureau to use a sixth category, which is some other race. Okay? And respondents may now, post um, the 1990 census, report more than one race. Okay? So people identify then their origin. So uh, ethnicity is about your origin. It is not about your race. Um, as um, Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish, and they may be of any race. Right? So ethnic de designations are completely separate from racial classifications. And that's important when we talk about uh, race and ethnicity. So what are these definitions? What is the definition of white? What is a white person in any data that you may use in a secondary data uh, analysis? Does anyone know this definition off the top of their head? I did not. And I talk about white people a lot. So I was really <laughs> interested to know who are white people. So who are white people? OK, white people are is a person having origins in any of the original peoples of Europe, the Middle East, or North Africa. So it is not confined to those derived from the Caucasus Mountains. It extends a little bit further um, than that. And includes everyone essentially in the Middle East and North, North Africa. That, those are all, by the census um, OMB um, definitions, those are all white people. Okay? It includes people who indicate their race as white itself, but also people who would indicate their race as saying um, Irish or German or Italian or Lebanese, Arab Moroccan or, or Caucasian. And these are in quotes because this is right from um, the census website. Right? It is very important to note that in every um, racial classification I could find on the census website, white comes first. Right? That is not lexicographic but it comes first, right? And so I'll, I'll talk about it first. And so this link will be on the website and you can see that from all of the classifications. Okay? So those are uh, white people. I'm going to do these definitions in the order that they appear um, on the census website. Okay? So um, who are black or African-American people? <laughs> this definition will be a little bit incongruent with the first one because it will say that a person having origins in any of the black racial groups of Africa. Okay. So we are now going once again back to the African continent, but now we're explicitly saying that there are whites in Africa who are obviously from North Africa, and everyone else in Africa would be from the black racial groups of Africa. So that this is a confining them to being of sub-Saharan Africa. It includes people who say that their race is black or African American, but also entries such as uh, African American, Kenyan, Nigerian, or Haitian, which was not in this grouping which was confining itself to people of the black uh, racial groups in Africa. So those who are from, uh, say, Caribbean islands who would classify themselves as Haitian are also recorded as uh, black. But it's not clear that that person would be necessarily, given uh, Haiti's history, black or, or white. Right? So there's some commingling of um, ancestry here um, in, a pretty unclear, in a pretty unclear way. And black always comes uh, second. Right? Always comes second. This is, it never begins. I've never seen the racial classifications on the census website start, say, with Asians, which would be the sort of alphabetical way of defining race. Now, who are American Indian or an Alaska Native? So I will say Alaska Native should be pretty self-explanatory by what it, it, it says. But who are uh, American Indians? Once again, something that we use but don't necessarily know the definition of, right? It is a person having origins in any of the original peoples of North and South America, um, including Central America, and who maintains tribal affiliation or community attachment to that group. Um, it includes people who ind indicate their race as uh, the category itself, but also those who would give an explicit uh, tribal designation. Right? All of those people are uh, American Indian and Alaska, Alaska Natives. Okay? Um, and so this group always, um, the census uh, website always puts American Indian and Alaska Native uh, third. Okay? Um, Asians. And this is going to become a little bit tricky because we have another category of which um, there is some overlap. But Asians are persons having um, origins in any of the original peoples of the Far East. Because remember, the Middle East, they are white. Asians come from the, uh, the Far East, Southeast Asia, or the Indian subcontinent. 
And so these will be people um, everywhere from geographically, this is of course uh, the widest area of coverage in terms of geography, but everywhere from Cambodia and China to India, uh, Japan, Korea, Malaysia, Pakistan, the Philippine Islands, Thailand, and Vietnam. Right? All of those um, groups fall under the Asian racial category. And so people who report themselves as Filipino, Korean, Vietnamese, other Asian are always going to be in the Asian uh, racial category. They could, because this, and I'll go to this in a second, because this is self-disclosed, you may uh, consider yourself Asian, you may consider yourself white. You couldn't be American Indian or Alaska Native, right? So some of this, some, some categories are excluded, but where you would actually fall is your own self-report. So it's very important to note that this is all now self-reported data, but I'll talk about what this meant historically in, in a second. Okay, and this category is always, always four, okay? And now we have Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander, okay? But note, Pacific Islands did fall into the designation of, of Asian. So, so there will be, once again, a little bit of incongruence here. And these are people having um, origins in any of the original peoples of Hawaii, Guam, Samoa, or other Pacific islands. And so it includes uh, Fijian, um, Marshallese, uh, Native Hawaiian, Samoan, uh, Tongan, and other Pacific islanders are all in this uh, racial classification. And then we have ethnicity, um, which is recorded separately from race. And then there's the category some other race, which means of all of these groupings of the world, I fall outside of that by my own disclosure, and I am a member of some other race. And so ethnicity is disclosed um, independent of race. So one marks their race and marks their ethnicity separately. And what does it mean then to be Hispanic or Latino? Because the other category is non-Hispanic or Latino. So if this applies to you, you are um, of, his, of Hispanic ethnicity. So it's a person of Cuban, Mexican, Puerto Rican, South or Central American, or other Spanish culture or origin, regardless of race. Which is a bit interesting um, because Brazil is in South America and they would have, they would not want to be of Spanish origin by um, historical terms. So the term Spanish origin can be used in addition to uh, Hispanic or Latino. So there's some mapping, once again, of geography, but this is not a racial uh, classification. This is one of, of origin. Now, critical to note that this uh, ethnic classification has become used as a racial classification for a lot of uh, empirical analysis. So in the 2010 census, um, more than a third of those claiming Hispanic ethnicity claimed also to be of some other race. Um, and that, so they did not fall into any racial designation. Uh, they didn't want to say any racial designation. So there is some discussion of whether Hispanic should be also a racial classification or whether it is, um, as it's used currently, an ethnic classification. Okay, so um, these categories are the most current definitions that are used um, by OMB and by the census, but obviously these categories have changed over time. And it's very important because until um, the uh, 1960 census, race was determined, say, in census records or even in many surveys, by the surveyor. So the surveyor would simply look at you and say, this is what I believe your race to be. And that was also a time period in which there were fewer racial classifications than there are today. So um, categories until 1850 had uh, white and non-white. And so historically, um, we tend to use and assume that all of the non-whites are black. Um, then in 1860, uh, Native American was recorded. And for some of this, it's important to note that um, they would record uh, Native Americans as Indians, and then they would separately record Indians on reservations, Indians not on reservations. And so once again, there's a geographic uh, split. By 1870, Chinese is added. That is not the Asian category. The category literally was Chinese. And then Japanese was added in 1890. Filipino, Korean, and Hindu were added in 1920, all of which now are in the, uh, um, not Filipino, but uh, the, the Asian category. And then Mexican was added in 1930. 
So um, you can see all of this. The Pew uh, website has a great historical um, diagram of what the racial classifications were and what ethnic groups fell um, under them over time. So when you see a lot of analysis, say before 1960, extending racial analysis over long periods of time, it is commingling self-reported race with surveyor assessed race. And so there may be some significant measurement error in any sort of longitudinal analysis. So even allowing for multiple categories uh, to be checked as we now um, have it, the race measures uh, that we use now are all self-reported. Um, they do not easily map to uh, nativity. Um, and they can apply to very different groups, which vary by geographic concentration over other measures, which makes the empirical analysis um, somewhat very difficult. Um, so someone asked me uh, recently um, in the controversy, say, of um, Rachel Donzel, who considered herself uh, black, in any survey, say a census survey, if she checks African American, there is no supplementary check of sort of correcting that, right? Um, and that would be reported as a, a, a black person. So anyone could be their own self-reported. Can you tell that nativity? You know, nativity is supposed to be in the Hispanic ethnicity designation, but it's a very, either you're in the box or out of the box. And so there isn't any other way um, in these definitions. So it marries some, because some of the definitions talk about original people to a geographic area, and some of the definitions um, do not. So these categories um, are, are certainly problematic, but they're also systematic. Right? And so not having um, a, a racial categorization, even if it is flawed, might not necessarily be an improvement over what we currently have. Right? So um, to do comparative analysis over time and between groups, it's important to have some sort of consistent measure of race that is in some way time invariant so that people of a particular classification can always be noted as being such. Right? So imagine if we recorded race separately. And so what happens with these definitions, like many things that come out of federal surveys, they're used in almost every other survey um, and nearly always, uh, almost always mapped um, one to one. So we take our racial classifications and a lot of other data outside of the census using these census definitions of race. But if we recorded race separately and differently or allowed for complete self-categorization of race, in other words, you left a race box completely blank and had people write in their own responses for race, it would really be very hard to have generalizable claims across um, uh, disparate data sets or even uh, over time about racial classification. So there are advantages and disadvantages to these definitions, and it's important to note that. So what about race and ethnicity, right? So using these definitions obviously leads to uh, several problems. Um, a salient example is the discussion of research on the Hispanic or Latino uh, population which commonly, uh, if you're on social media or even the way that it's talked about in academe, is typically coded as a racial designation, but technically it's an ethnic uh, designation. So when you're talking about Hispanic uh, um, populations, you're typically in analysis talking about white Hispanics as a separate, um, as a separate group. Typically in the data, not all Hispanics are lumped together if they have a um, non-white racial designation. So black Hispanics, for example, who might be someone, say, from a uh, Caribbean island, um, would be just classified with all the other, other blacks. And that might be problematic for analyzing Hispanic or the Hispanic population. So it's always really important to think about um, and check how populations are defined in any racial analysis that you see. Right? So how are blacks defined? That's a racial category. But that black grouping may include Hispanics and um, it will it can include Hispanics and non-Hispanics, and are those actually separately broken out? Because some of the empirical trends that we might see may be explained by ethnic differences as opposed to purely racial ones. So um, race and ethnicity are most often used in empirical analysis, and I'm speaking as, as a social scientist more broadly, as explanatory variables. Um, and so um, we are typically looking to do one of two things with a racial variable conditional on these classifications. So we're thinking about how, um, looking to see the average of some measure by race or ethnicity itself. In other words, we have some other outcome, some other y, and we're simply looking to see what that y is equal to, that y bar is equal to, conditional on race, right? So if we're looking at the fraction, say, of African Americans who are unemployed, we're looking at, given a racial classification, 
the fraction of people who are unemployed or looking at wages for Asians, we now have all of the wages reported by those who self-report themselves to be Asian and we take the average of those and that's the average wage for those who are, who are Asian. The other thing that we're interested in is typically then the proportion of the population belonging to some category that is um, a particular race or ethnicity. Right? So that would say, for example, the share of the school-aged population that is Native American, right? or the share of the school-aged population that is Asian. Right? So that's then conditional on some other variable. How is this distributed over uh, racial classifications? And those are the two primary ways in which we use or think about um, race in uh, empirical analysis. So um, even in more sophisticated analysis, um, race is still fundamentally telling us about the average for people in that existing classification. Right? That's essentially all you can get out of um, these race variables. So if I'm running a, a linear regression model and I have some outcome variable y, and a is my intercept, and b1 is my uh, race variable, and I um, discreetly categorize it for all of these races, and I control for all of these other sorts of things that go into x, what I'm estimating with B1 is the average level effect, right, or intercept shifter, for the race variable conditional on all the other controls that I'm looking at. Okay? And what this really tells me then is it's just a race-specific intercept. Right? That's what I'm getting out of any race effect that I would see in any type of racial analysis. And I'm going to have a diagram that shows you um, what I'm talking about in a second. right? This is um, still, to this day, the state of the art, basically, in race analysis. In any sort of paper I review, any other paper I see, papers I write, um, look at race in this way. Right? It is just going to be essentially an intercept uh, shifter. You could be a little bit more um, sophisticated by trying to think about um, the distribution. So what you do instead of just having an intercept is you might want to see that there's a slope difference, right? So um, I can now estimate this equation. And so this is really, really sophisticated um, race analysis. Um, it's taking some other variable m and then interacting it with race to see not only do I have a race-specific intercept, but do I have differences in the slope by race uh, it itself, right? So what you're estimating here in B2 is the slope effect for race, conditional once again on all my controls, and then for a different intercept uh, by race. Okay. So what would that look like in analysis? So this is coming from the, um, the, the Raj Chetty project, which is looking at income mobility over time. And what's great here is we have these race-specific intercepts and these race-specific slopes. Right. So the Intercepts are going to be given um, where, of course, they are the intercepts, and they're different intercepts by uh, race. But as you'll see in this example, Hispanics and whites have essentially the same intercept. They're blue and yellow, but they have different slopes. So if I was estimating this equation, I would see that I would have similar intercept effects for the white um, uh, racial category, my white B1 and my Hispanic uh, B1 but I would have differences in the slope, my B2s for whites and Hispanics. And that is what racial analysis uh, empirically is, is telling us, differences in intercepts and differences in slopes for members of these racial categories as defined uh, by OMB. So they're averages, right? So the, the average is useful information. It's obviously the first summary statistic that we would want to, to turn to. Um, but we might not only care about the, the average. Averages, of course, have lots of problems. They can be skewed by outliers, for example. And they might not necessarily get us the answer to the questions that we'd want um, to have answers to. So we're not saying anything typically about the distribution itself by race and ethnicity when we do this sort of analysis, right? because we're simply looking at differences in slopes and differences in intercepts. So the distribution could actually be far more important um, depending on the question that you're asking. Right? And we're not doing any distributional analysis with the way that we typically encode race in our empirical work. And differences in variance between uh, racial and ethnic groups could be very important as well. So typically, if I'm running a wage equation, um, and I'll return to this when I talk about discrimination in a second, and I have a racial difference, what I'm looking at is a difference in the average wage, say, by race. 
But what I might really care about is the black or white or Asian or um, uh, Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander income distribution, right, which could be fundamentally different. Right? Some of that will be captured by the average, but it wouldn't tell me anything about, say, uh, kurtosis or something in one distribution relative to another, whether one has really, really thick tails or really thin tails relative to another. And that might be really important for policy, particularly for policies that will target people at one end of the income distribution itself. That could, of course, vary by race. So by definition, right, the average is estimated over everyone that's assigned to uh, this category. And that's important because the group difference effect is literally the unweighted sum, right, of all of the members of the group. And so when we're doing this racial analysis, we really are counting every person in there sort of equally, unless you have data that might use population weights, but all that's trying to do is to get you to count everyone in the data as they exist in the population. And that may or may not be what you'd actually want an answer to. And so this is an aggregation of individuals, and so we typically interpret this as a group uh, effect, but is it actually a group, is it actually a group effect? And um, I pose that to the group because I'm still thinking about whether it actually is a group effect or not, right? It is in the statistical sense, but when we start to interpret this in terms of policy, it may or may not be appropriate to think of it in that way. So what is missing um, in these racial categories now that we've sort of talked about how we define them? Um, they don't tell us very much or anything at all about heterogeneity in these racial experiences or classifications. And especially what I mean by that is heterogeneity among those who would have the same racial classification or self-report, right? So all white people are lumped uh, together. And as you saw from the definition of this white uh, category, it includes people who are from Europe, it includes people who are from North Africa, and it includes people who are from the Middle East. Right? So they are all together in the white category. But I would argue that they would have very different experiences as white people. Right? Conditional say on the question that we're, we're asking. Right? They would even have, for example, different phenotypes or appear differently in the population. They might be assumed uh, um, to have different interactions, say, with law enforcement, conditional on their, on their skin shade. And the skin shade in that category will vary considerably. Right? We'll have a lot of heterogeneity among all of the people who are white people by this census classification. None of that is reflected in these sort of averages over all of, all of the white people. And so that heterogeneity could speak to significant um, differences for members of the same racial category. And um, that might be important for policy discussions, because what we might want to do is think about these racial differences and then think about the heterogeneity within these racial differences as well, which gets back to this issue about the distributions among those who are in the same racial classification. So um, the real problem with these race um, variables is that they're either on or off, right? You're either self-reporting in the racial classification or, or you're not. And so it's very difficult many times to think about cumulative effects, um, even in sort of panel data that follows the same person over time, because different racial categories can have differences in saline experiences at different points in the life cycle. So if where people end up at the time of the survey is a multi-generational process itself, um, or if it's a cumulative process, we may miss some of those critical windows when race was actually really important and could be something that we want to identify and have policy action on. And we will miss that if we're just looking at the outcome now, say the labor market experience of someone is a, clearly from any um, basic economic model, a cumulative experience, right, of from everything from conception and their fetal origins, which might give them differences in human capital, all the way through their schooling experiences, parental resources, et cetera, et cetera. And now I'm measuring everything at the time of the labor market. And those differences that might manifest themselves as appearing as a racial effect could actually be a cumulative effect where race is saline at some points and not saline at other points, and where policy could have been particularly useful in ameliorating any of those uh, racial inequalities that we see. So um, one way of advancing um, beyond the current definitions is to use subcategories to expand uh, the analysis. Um, and that gets us closer to sort of the sources of this heterogeneity, right? So in other words, I would like to break these categories of white and black and Asian apart 
because that would help me to say something more about what is going on and what would be appropriate and important. This, though, requires um, two things. I think it requires, number one, more data purely to do that sort of analysis. But the second is you need to have some historical and contemporary knowledge about the racial formations and how they've changed over time and space. Right? So it's very important that before you think about moving and advancing in this area, you understand the population um, that you're trying to do some analysis for. So here's one example, and this example is just coming from me as uh, someone native to uh, the Twin Cities in Minnesota. So if I was going to analyze Asians in the um, Minneapolis to St. Paul metropolitan statistical area, um, that would almost be useless for me to, to analyze because it contains a wide heterogeneous uh, group. A significant portion of that group will be Hmong. Um, the Hmong, we have one of the largest uh, Hmong populations in the United States, in the Twin Cities. And this Hmong population is quite distinct from others who would also have this Asian classification. Um, research has found very high poverty rates among the Hmong population specifically um, in the Minneapolis-St. Paul metropolitan statistical area. Um, around a third of the Hmong in the most recent uh, census uh, uh, data are found to um, be in poverty. And that's two times the national uh, average, which itself is higher than the Asian national average for those uh, in, in poverty. Um, so taking Asian in the census definition would combine Hmong immigrants to the United States who came from a very different historical and political circumstance um, from uh, Laos with those who are um, of South Asian and East Asian uh, descent. All of these are Asian by the census definitions, but have very heterogeneous immigration experiences in and of themselves, which may have differences in the rates of poverty, human capital attainment, et cetera, that we would see in census data. So the Asian classification in this particular MSA I would need more information on to say something. What you could end up with is essentially a spurious result where you might say Asians do very well, say, in the Minneapolis-St. Paul MSA, but that's ignoring a very large fraction of this Asian population who may be particularly impoverished relative to other Asians. Right? So this is not comparing them to any other group, but simply comparing them to other Asians in the same group. And so um, recent research, for example, on racial wealth inequality has investigated the ways in which sort of classic racial definitions um, can obscure these differences uh, within uh, races. And so another example of this is uh, going back to this um, Asian racial category. Uh, the Asian population has high uh, degrees of geographic um, dissimilarity over uh, particular um, cities. And so if Asians are geographically concentrated in areas where, for example, housing prices are uh, relatively high, they will appear to be wealthier simply for geographic reasons and not for um, uh, other reasons that we might want to explain, say, in economic models of wealth formation, for example. So you'd want to take into account these geographic distributions, particularly when you're looking at national data, to sort of factor them out in explaining these racial differences, because not all racial groups are um, in the United States, in, the, in all of the parts of the United States, in equal proportions. Um, and another example is that recent African immigrants may have better or worse economic outcomes than other blacks, but this will be hidden by an analysis that just looks at everyone in that category as all being black. So um, the National Asset Scorecard um, for Communities of Color was uh, an ambitious uh, project which sought to analyze racial wealth disparities within and between racial groups in a number of American cities. And so I'm going to go through some of the slides of this project because you're going to see a lot of heterogeneity within racial classifications. And the reason that project is uh, still important in informing our analysis of racial wealth inequality is not the analysis that necessarily was between races, which you can get from other standard sources, but a significant amount of heterogeneity within races, which is important, and then also which varies <coughs> over cities. And so DC comes up in this example as well. So if you look at this from the, from the SIP data, and I'm using this by permission of Sandy. I want to be very clear. This is all from uh, Sandy Darity and Derek Hamilton. And I have their permission to use this. I want to assure you. Um, this is all coming from SIP data. So the SIP data has racial classifications similarly to the way that we were just talking about the racial classifications in census data. So if you look at median net worth and the, um, and the relative holdings um, of these uh, racial and ethnic classifications uh, relative to, to whites, this is what the national data 
would show you um, in the survey of, of income and program, program participants. So that for a dollar of uh, white wealth, the uh, average Afri the average black uh, person has nine cents, right? In 2005 and in 2011 has six cents. And so the average Asian had a dollar and 24, um, one dollar and 24 cents for every dollar of white wealth, but by 2011 had 83 uh, cents. And for Hispanics, it went from 14 cents down to seven cents. But if you go and look at the uh, ancestral origin distributions, which is what they were using within these racial classifications, they were breaking apart these subcategories. So blacks became not just this black category, but now became much more specific. So you could be a US black descendant. You could be a Caribbean black, which is someone who is native to uh, uh, um, an island in the Caribbean. You could be um, from Cape uh, Bernardo, okay, which is particular um, to uh, the Boston area, which has a very large uh, Cape Bernardian population or a African black, which would be um, an, a black African immigrant. Right? So those subcategories are going to be important because they're going to then look at this racial wealth data within those subcategories and also varying them over cities in the United States. So um, they do not break up uh, the uh, white category that is by design because they're looking at this among communities of color for the white population, but you could similarly divide the white population um, in subsequent work by those who are from the Middle East and North Africa as opposed to those who would have ancestral origins to Europe to see if there are differences in wealth there for that group. But if you look at the Asian uh, subtotal, we're now breaking down all of these groups to Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Filipino, Vietnamese, um, Asian, Indian, or other uh, Asian, and the uh, Latino uh, um, designation is now broken into Mexican, Cuban, Puerto Rican, Dominican, South American Latino, or Central American uh, Latino, excluding the Mexican uh, category or other Latino. So what is this data uh, um, telling us? And the Native American subtotal are, are those who have tribal enrollment and those who don't. If you're looking at the median household income, for these groups within these racial categories, there's a significant amount of heterogeneity. So when you get to, for example, Boston, US black descendants have significantly lower uh, household income than those who are Caribbean black. Right? In the same uh, metropolitan statistical area in the Boston uh, area. And similarly, you'll see that those who are South American uh, Latino earn much more than those who are Cubans in Miami. So all of this would be collapsed into the average, right, if we're just looking at this um, for um, racial or ethnic classifications. But this heterogeneity is obviously telling us something very uh, Im important. Um, if you're looking, for example, um, for the earnings of those who have tribal origins and you're looking in Tulsa, those who have uh, Cherokee tribal en en enrollment earn significantly more um, than those who are, do not have a tribal affiliation, a formal tribal affiliation. And then if you look at this heterogeneity um, in Los Angeles, which has a large Asian population, but broken down into um, ethnicity, there's a huge difference between um, Asian Indians, those from the Indian subcontinent, versus, for example, those who are Korean. And all of this would be subsumed or assumed away in the average um, of these groups. And this is important when you look even at things like home ownership, right? Once again, significant differences for US black descendants um, versus those who are Caribbean black in home ownership in Miami, for example, or even in uh, the Boston uh, area, and even in, in DC, right, where the home ownership, and these flip, right? So relative to uh, African blacks, the home ownership rate of black descendants in Washington, DC area is significantly higher. Um, if you're looking at the home ownership rates among the racial and ethnic groups, it's actually lower in the Los Angeles area for those who are Asian Indians and much higher for those who are Chinese or Japanese um, ethnic descent. And then when you get to wealth, these become these really um, uh, interesting uh, results. So probably most salient or, 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 or punchline from this study is that the average um, black US descendant has $8 of wealth in Boston whereas those who are Caribbean black have around $18,000. That's a significant wealth difference within the same racial category. And so having some knowledge about the racial formations in the Boston area 
gives us much better information about racial wealth inequality, but also intra-racial wealth inequality itself. Um, similarly, you'll see significant differences in Miami for those who are Cuban who have around $22,000 of, of wealth versus those who are South American Latino who have $1,200 of wealth. Right? So all of these would fall into the white Hispanic or Hispanic category that you would see in other forms of analysis. And significant differences in wealth. Koreans, for example, in Los Angeles do significantly worse than Chinese or, or Asian Indians. And a big part of this difference for those, um, if you look at these wealth uh, numbers here um, for these Asian descendants, you see that they're not as populous in these other um, MSAs who so we don't have data on them. But a lot of this will be in areas that have, of course, high housing prices. So a lot of this wealth is tied to real estate markets that have very high uh, prices, both in Los Angeles and I don't have to tell you in this audience, um, high housing prices in DC. So there are many instances, and this example really shows you that there are many instances in which social science theory really does not square with the empirical um, analysis of, of race. And so in economics, and I'm just going to go because this is uh, what I know best, um, traditional models are, are egocentric. And so people don't really, um, although economists do a lot of racial analysis, there's nothing theoretically that we have in economics that really is a theory of, of, of race. It's sort of attack on an empirical work, but there's very little work theoretically about sort of members of racial groups. If you take sort of a standard microeconomic theory course, you're not going to see any model written down about race. Right? There just, just isn't. People have preferences. They have preferences between different groups. But everybody is their own little um, egocentric person running around in their little atoms. They might form households and do some bargaining within those households, but those households themselves don't have any racial classifications um, themselves, right? So analysis, though, proceeds, and this happens not only in economics. I don't want to pick on economics. Sociologists do this as well. Political scientists do this. Other social scientists uh, do this, even though there's been very little theoretical development about what that race uh, variable would actually mean. This influences, though, how we interpret those racial uh, variables. And I'll talk about that in, in a second. So what, what can we do uh, about these sort of conceptual issues? So go back to those uh, regressions and those coefficients that I was uh, talking about. And so typically, we're looking at individual outcomes. So say that this Y was, was earnings, and this was my, my regression, right? So how should we think about this beta 1 coefficient if I'm looking at the earnings of individuals, and then I'm taking together all of the individuals who have a specific racial classification and looking at their average level difference effect relative to all of the other groups? What does it actually um, mean? Is this the average? Is this for the average black person, even though we have these controls? And then what does that tell us actually uh, about race? And there's a way in which economists have um, interpreted these coefficients, these beta ones, very differently over, over time. Um, and it's changed um, without any subsequent sort of theoretical development, unfortunately. So in most uh, traditional uh, economic analysis, theory would predict that the coefficient on beta 1 should be close to, to 0. Right? So in other words, once I've controlled for all of the choice variables and inputs, say, into a human capital production function, that would explain all the differences in wages that I would observe. And there wouldn't be any residual racial effect itself. And it really should be that way because race isn't even in the model that you're writing down about this, so it had better be equal to zero, right? so you can just sort of wave your hand away at it. Yet, I have yet to see any empirical analysis where that race effect is actually zero. right? So you would think the first thing we would do is sort of you know, knock on the door of the theorist down the hall and say, can you get to work on this race thing? And they're too busy playing games, literally. Um, so we have very little um, theory to tell us why um, this sort of egocentric nature is going to work to explain these group differences and outcomes, right? So how is this usually interpreted? And so a typical sort of old school way of detecting discrimination would be to take the beta 1 coefficient as evidence of discrimination. In other words, I've now looked at all of the measurable human capital inputs, and this beta 1, say, um, for those who are Asian is negative, which would be evidence of a wage penalty for Asians, which would be most consistent with discrimination because all of these other observables are controlled for. So there's something different here. So the controls themselves are the choices that people would actually make. And the characteristics that should you know, not be related to labor market outcomes shouldn't matter to labor market outcomes. 
if there's not discrimination in the market, so that beta one should be zero. And if it's not zero or statistically distinguishable from zero, then I have some evidence of labor market discrimination. Now, um, if you regress, for example, wages on age, sex, education, work experience, geographic location, controls for unemployment rates, controls for the quality of schooling, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, kitchen sink regression, I should not be able to detect any difference um, for race alone by itself, right? It should not have an influence on wages that is independent of all of these other, uh, other effects. So these have fallen out of favor almost completely um, in uh, empirical analysis, at least in economics, because the, we now believe that there are many factors related to wages, which would be in any theoretical model someone's marginal productivity, that are not included in those uh, uh, regressions because they're not observed uh, by the econometrician, right? Um, and the thought is that these omitted factors could be correlated with race or ethnicity or drive that level effect that we're seeing by race or ethnicity. So these could be um, non-cognitive skills, for example, someone's teamwork, their persistence, their drive, their independence, their personality, et cetera, or omitted skills, right? So cognitive skills, school, education inequality, communication skills, et cetera. There's a problem with this because we're running individual level regressions and what you then have to argue is that these non-cognitive or cognitive skills vary by group because you've estimated these with an individual regression and you're looking at a group effect. So the only way that these omitted factors can work to explain these racial differences is if they are correlated with the group itself. That's just extremely important and that has to be true statistically. But wouldn't you think that if there were differences in, for example, school quality, by race that we want to talk about differences in school quality between races in these, even in these egocentric models of explaining this difference by race. So we have a difficult time in economics thinking about racial inequality, which should explain some of these unobserved factors themselves, right? So what we would think about doing is parsing out, say that B1 coefficient into factors that are related to racial inequality which give rise to racial inequality and those which do not. That typically is not the way um, that economists proceed because they'd like for the market to have none of these sort of structural factors, the market should give them all away. So this example from discrimination shows that the issue hinges on how we interpret this race coefficient, right? Is it racial inequality, is it discrimination, or is it actually some omitted factor? So it could be seen as evidence of discrimination or disparate impact, or it could reflect those admitted factors, but those factors would have to be correlated with race or ethnicity to drive the result. So when we talk about these effects that vary by race, typically we do not talk about the fact that whatever is omitted and whatever um, one would want to critique about these models itself has to be strongly correlated with race or ethnicity itself to drive the analysis. So that would be my take home message, at least from this part of this, is that that has to be part of the way that we discuss these empirical results. So what about some deeper um, uh, conceptual uh, issues? Now, one new approach has been to think of these outcomes by race not as the average um, of all the individuals who belong to a specific uh, racial category, but as the outcome of a process that is group specific by nature, right? So thinking and putting people theoretically into groups in a way that would marry the way that we do empirical analysis with um, the theoretical development that we should use for that. And so in economics, this is referred to as stratification uh, economics. And so this was pioneered. It's not um, a coincidence that I was using the work of um, William Darity and Derek Hamilton, who really pioneered stratification economics. But it seeks to look at race and ethnic outcomes as arising from group conflict over resources. And that sort of squares the circle that we have uh, currently as a problem in empirical economics is because it now explicitly gives a role for racial inequality to be related to these omitted factors that we think drive the race coefficient. But in stratification economics, they exist because race is a salient point of policy and resource allocation in the way that we make decisions um, about policy in the United States. So the reason why the race variable matters is because race is important for how we divide resources and how we develop policy uh, currently. So this helps guides and motivates the group analysis because now it gives you a reason why you might expect a group effect even if you have all of these individual controls controlled for, say, in your empirical analysis. So 
thinking along the, the lines of groups and groups competing over resources gives you and resolves sort of two issues in the racial analysis, right? It gives you differences in the cumulative effects that one might um, expect and that may play out over the life cycle at different stages of uh, the life cycle. And then we can begin discussing policy um, that has disparate impact by group, right? Rather than being an average um, due to choices made by all of the members of the group themselves, right? So when you think about the way that economists would typically interpret these things, everyone in the group is making these similar decisions, but we really don't have any theoretical way of thinking about why they'd be in this group and all make these similar decisions. If there were all of these different returns, um, for example, in the market, they probably shouldn't exist. But in stratification economics, the group actually is driving or a key source of those differences themselves. And so this offers us a new way of thinking about um, the dynamics and, frankly, structural impact of a lot of different, different outcomes, whether we're thinking about segregation or sort of physical separation itself, both over place and over, over time. And I've done a lot of work now that looks at historical segregation having uh, contemporary impacts and who was moving and segregating and what that actually means. Um, discrimination, which is about power between uh, groups and control of uh, resources. Um, resource allocation itself, the distribution of uh, resources. So there's some exciting work now in political science which looks at policy that becomes coded um, by race and how political support for policies becomes very different when it's coded by race or, or, or not by race. So a co-author of mine, Shari Eli, has a, a great paper that looks at it is not the case, for example, that the South has um, strong preferences um, for low levels of resource allocation, say, for um, aid to uh, um, mothers and, and children. So for example, Southern states were quite generous in their Confederate widows' pensions, right? because those are race specific. Right? There are no black Confederate widows. And so you can have a very generous welfare benefit as long as it is racially exclusionary. Right? And so that's an important way of thinking about how resource allocation might map to race and give rise to these racial differences. Um, investment, and this could be community level investment given geographic segregation in areas. Um, redlining, and there's a lot of research now on um, redlining, for example, returns on investment. Right, So given that there might be differences in market returns to uh, human capital investment, um, that would vary by race, optimal decisions by those in different racial categories should be different. And then thinking about inequality more broadly will be one more way of, of thinking about these differences. So questions to ask, and so I will, I will stop um, after uh, this slide and um, we will, I think I'm the last thing holding everyone between lunch, okay. So um, you're, you're getting ready to eat. So the <laughs> questions to ask is, how is race defined in this discussion? So whenever you see any racial analysis that is out there, the first thing to ask given these definitions is how are they defining race? Who are, um, and it might seem like an odd question, but you really want to ask, who are the white people? Who are the black people? Who are the Asians? Who is Hispanic? Because that would be an ethnic designation, and what races are they including in that Hispanic um, designation? Who are the uh, Pacific Islanders, et cetera, et cetera? And then is there any thinking about heterogeneity within that racial classification, or are they only reporting differences average differences between members of the groups. Typically, they're reporting average differences between members of the group, which is fine, but a question that you might want to ask for policy is the underlying variance or the underlying distribution within those racial categories themselves. And next, are we assuming a group or basically an average of individuals framework, right? So you shouldn't run any empirical analysis without some idea or some theoretical model behind it. Are you running an egocentric model? If you're thinking about when economists talk about this, it's almost always going to be an egocentric model. Others are thinking about relations between groups, and it's important for them to think about those frameworks specifically as they're thinking about policy and the role for policy for them. And then how do the questions and answers to those questions inform the interpretation that we would have of the results. Right? So who are the people defined in, in, in this group? How are they defining group? Are we thinking about heterogeneity within that group? And we're thinking about inequality. And are we assuming an, an egocentric model or a group model? And then how does that actually help inform the interpretation that I'm giving to whatever averages might be reported in, in the data? have definitely been given a lot of food for thought. Mm -hmm.
uh, as we're chewing on that. Hopefully we have some good things for you to chew on <laughs> in reality. Um, we're going to take a break. Are we good? And Nina, are we good? OK, good. Before I send you out there, I want to make sure there's something there. We're going to take a break for everyone to grab lunch again. As with the last time, I would like to give our speakers a chance to go and get served first so that they can uh, complete that before we start with the Q&A. Um, but we're going to take a break now. We should resume about 10 minutes before 1 uh, to start with the Q&A if you have specific questions or comments from either of our presentations this morning. And then after that, we will get into the more practical part of the workshop where we look at some specific examples and, and work through them. I think we're going to work through that together, actually. Yeah. OK. So we will break, let our speakers step out and get something. If you need a restroom, you can go out this door, the glass door, then go out the white door. <laughs> and the restrooms are right down that hall. So we'll meet back here, uh, ready to start the next part of the program at 12.50. Thanks. All right, so there are two microphones. I have one. Jacova has the other. So if you have a question, uh, raise your hand, or comment even. Uh, raise your hand, and we will get you the microphone. So questions, thoughts, feedback on what we heard. Um, I know, Trevon, you said you weren't going to talk about econometrics, but I'm going to still ask you an econometrics <laughs> question. Um, because, I, you know, I, I totally like by what you're saying that a lot of research has not sort of thought theoretically about these things. But are there, there are some methods that seem that could get at it. So, like, maybe the solution is just to have, like, best practices. Like, don't just control for race, do decompositions. Or run regressions separately by race so you can look at the differences by race. Like, so is that part of the solution? And then I have a second really specific question about um, not only just looking at sort of how much worse non-white people are doing, but also looking at a premium that white people receive. And I know it's a little bit problematic because you would compare it to like an average to the whole population. But I'm just curious your thoughts on a method like that. Um, so I was trying to do them in order. So the, so, so the first uh, question, I do think that some best practices exist. So if you look. At, and I think this also includes, um, this talk isn't specifically about gender, but also bringing gender into this as well, so that we're not thinking about um, all blacks and we want to think about gender dimensions within races as well as another source of heterogeneity. And so if you go back to even this uh, Chetty mobility work, we find significant differences in mobility between black men and black women, right? And so we would never know that if we were just looking at black mobility overall. And so this average for all black people obscures a big difference between two different groups of black people. And so that has now become uh, an issue of policy. Import in doing that sort of subsequent analysis is very um, significant. But also I think there's a role for qualitative research um, in economics with respect to race as well. That's not a component that we've thought of a lot as economists, but how people are thinking about. So one standard um, question when we were discussing this at lunch is, what do people think when they're checking the box for race and how are they defining race? So rarely do we see this extensive definition when you sort of check a box on a survey, but certainly you've responded recently probably to a Qualtrics survey or some other sort of survey that's asked you your race or ethnicity. And what were you thinking when you checked the box that you, you checked maps into these definitions, or maybe it doesn't. And so the first thing to understand is, do people really understand race the way that we've defined it administratively to the point where we can actually use it in, in data? Um, and then your second question was about Oh, yeah, yeah. So I, I think um, when we go back to this regression structure, we sort of think about differences between um, averages. And this goes to the interpretation of those results. So typically, say you see a negative uh, coefficient, say, um, on uh, Hispanics, right, uh, however they've been uh, defined. And we think of that as a, as a penalty. But this depends on the omitted group that you're uh, leaving out. And it is equally as valid statistically that that means that there's a premium for the other groups. And so I think in terms of a policy discussion, thinking about rather than posing all of these as penalties for being, say, black or Hispanic or Asian, um, premiums to being white or, or male might be another way of phrasing those discussions that would have, I think, significant um, important policy. Other questions? 
This is a very practical question. We constantly come up against problems of sample size, you know, even basic occupational analysis. And I was looking at your wealth data and thinking, oh, where does he get the sample from? But, you know, what are ways, how, how to, okay, you, you can interpret that and, you know, say, okay, we have agents and this includes a broader variety, but it doesn't really add that much to knowing what happens to Asians in that. So what strategies do people use around this? Apart from pushing data sets for new sample sizes. Well, I, I will say uh, to this, and certainly um, the, the data that I showed from the project with uh, Sandy and Derek, the first thing they would tell me is that it's expensive. Um, so collecting this sort of data is incredibly expensive because it is a survey that has to go out into the field. And so for most people involved in policy analysis, they simply don't have the resources to do these sorts of, of surveys. And then it's very difficult because you'd have a small sample size and what is the extent to which you could extrapolate from that. Even with this uh, national asset scorecard, to what extent can we extrapolate from that to a nationally representative sample? And this really is where I think the policy community in general needs to push on the federal government, who is really the, the, um, the largest mover in this area and actually has the resources to collect this information in a wide number of administrative data sets that would allow us to see if these differences are there. Um, you do need and you have a power problem with small sample sizes for, for any sort of analysis. And so you really do need to either combine this together with other uh, data that may have similar ways and, and expanding research networks so that we can have this data systematically gathered from a large number of different surveys would be one way of, of sort of um, getting the scale that you'd need to have this operate. But another is simply petitioning the Census Bureau and other sort of federal data collectors to have this administrative data collected uh, in their samples. I'm thinking in particularly in terms of education, this would be very, very valuable information to have because of the statistics that we gather continuously and annually on education. If we had those broken out by much finer um, uh, segments of the population and we would have the sufficient sample sizes in those data to be able to say something uh, significant. So if I could just add on to that, I'm Kilo Loki Jakazi and I funded the National Asset Scorecard Study when I was at the Ford Foundation, and it, it is expensive, um, but we were determined to try to get this disaggregation by not only race and ethnicity, but also um, uh, um, national origin and tribal affiliation. Um, it's difficult, it's, it's expensive, but it's also difficult to um, find the sample, um, so, there really was a process of creating um, um, a method for identifying um, the, the sample members and um, by geographic area, by um, cell phone, um, regular phone, just the whole range of, of, of approaches that were used um, in order to even just get the communities that we wanted in sufficient sizes. We also worked with um, the Federal Reserve Board in trying to um, get them to include within their surveys um, modules from um, the, the National Asset Scorecard Survey, because I agree, this really should be done at a federal level in order to get the, the sample size that you need, but also the frequency in terms of, of the collection. So um, I really appreciated your um, your comments about um, not only disaggregating race categories, but also about um, different uh, the uh, potential difference that race makes over the course of a life cycle. So I'm going to situate this question in sort of that area. Um, so we know, based on a lot of the work that Kilolo funded, that there's a huge racial wealth gap. And normally the way we think about that is sort of a point in time where we compare, you know, black wealth to white wealth or Hispanic wealth to, <clears throat> to white wealth. And uh, my question is, so when we, when, when, when we make those comparisons, we always have a sort of a running um, kind of commentary, which is that, well, we know the historical 
um, sort of discrimination against black people is partly to account for these differentials in wealth. So my question is, when we think about something like that, comparing wealth, and we think about the dyssynchronous nature of wealth accumulation in certain communities, right? So at some point you might have held wealth and it was taken away from you, then you rebuilt it, then it was taken away from you, et cetera. We could say the same thing for Native American communities, likely. And then we think about um, in some white families and in some white groups that wealth has been held for generations and accumulated over time, okay? So in that scenario, I just want you to comment generally on how do you think about that theoretically? Because the way we think about it now is we do the measurement and then we have the running commentary, right? So that means that the measurement isn't theoretically grounded. So I just want you to kind of comment on that. Um, there's a, a, a new round of research in economic history which has started to look at some of, uh, some of this. So some recent work by uh, Hoyt Bleakley and others um, that's looked at Georgia's land lottery in the early uh, 19th century, which was land from the Cherokee and other uh, nations by treaty um, given to the United States and then literally lotteried off uh, to, to white males. And they look at the effects of those who won the lottery and those who don't, and there weren't these large ratio, there weren't any differences between those who won the lottery or who didn't. Um, Leah Bustan and some co-authors have looked at uh, white wealth um, before and after the Civil War with linked data and find no, no differences um, with those who held many slaves. Of course, those are a source of wealth before emancipation and those uh, who come after. So one critique of that work, which has found no long-standing effects of these wealth distributions, um, which you could use to argue that we shouldn't have reparations or we shouldn't think about wealth as being something that has, as we said in this moment in commentary, this, these sort of cumulative effects. Behind all of that are, are a couple of other things that I think we have to bring into our analysis, which is first, the federal government historically um, engaged in huge wealth redistribution efforts that were racially restrictive. So um, you could just squat and just get a ton of land, right, if you were of the right race um, uh, historically, and that becomes a store uh, of wealth that you can use for many different uh, purposes. And wealth actually is something that allows you to have other opportunities, um, which we know are important. So I think a part of this is that the running commentary, I think, is largely incomplete because it's looking at accumulation of resources, but it's not looking at the role directly of policy in allowing those to accumulate resources, but also to protect the resources that they've uh, accumulated historically. So one of the things we might find about there being very little effect of, um, of destruction of wealth, say, after the Civil War, is that the political institutions don't transform or permanently transform, which is one thing that keeps those in power in a sort of oligarchy empowers through the political system as well. So I think we always have thought about this as wealth separate from the political process, but I think they're actually much more engaged with each other historically. So I think to do that analysis and think about these um, over a long time period, you have to bring in a role for active federal intervention into the transmission of wealth, which has happened historically for um, primarily for white Americans. And then think secondly about the ways in which political institutions protect that wealth or receive and, and allow further transfers of wealth. Um, I think it's safe to say that most of us who do policy research in Washington are very involved, in, uh, have backgrounds in, in uh, social science. Um, and I was struck, Sarah, when you were speaking by how important uh, historical research seemed to be informing what you were doing. And I think that's also true, obviously, of so much of the work that you've done, Trevon, which has a historical uh, background, uh, historical connection. I'm just wondering if either of you, both of you, have some comments on guidelines or suggestions for how public policy researchers can bring in the historical context a little bit better. Uh, that's a great question. I, I think that the, um, uh, so first of all, I'm not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't strictly call myself a policy researcher. Um, and so I'm in this position of, I think, of not knowing a lot of what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I mostly take your results and apply it to the field. So uh, that said, I think, um, you know, this was actually going to be a topic of a, a little bit of an exercise that I was going to have folks here do. 
which is, you know, we just need to, um, I think people often don't think to look at history. It's not sort of automatic, right, that we, we have, that, that every year the, the newest round of census data or this or that data comes out. And, um, you know, I know Mass Budget, for example, releases a, an analysis every year of, of, you know, the most recent data on workers in our state. Um, and we just have a little bit of like a tunnel vision of like what's happening right now. Um, and so it, it is a little bit of like a, a practice of principle and ground in this to even remember that um, everything that's happening right now is a product of so many things that have happened before um, and to seek out that, that information. Um, and, um, you know, this is, this is not something that all organizations on my end remember to do either. So I think it's just a practice that we have to build much more over time. That, that's uh, great. I think to add to that is uh, one thing that we can do to bring in some historical analysis, and this is something we currently see, I think, in a lot of policy debates, is we think about policy as giving us very precise estimates if it's done it correctly, if we use difference and differences or some other approach, about identifying the causal effect of something. But many things that are very interesting to us about historical trends are the trends themselves. And we don't have as much as economists um, believe that they have the best techniques. None of us are working with the best data. And so we have to think very hard about, you know, we just went over these racial categories, and we've been using these in our work for, for many years, but we really haven't thought about them um, deeply. And so we're using racial analysis, and we have race analysis, we have trends in racial data, but have we really thought about what they mean conditional on these definitions which may change over time? So I think we have to really think about um, and we have to bring history in to inform the way that we think about measurement more generally, um, which is quite important for policy. What questions we're asking, how people are responding to those questions, and what they think that they're responding to versus how we use and interpret the results that they're doing. That itself changes over time because these definitions change as society changes, and our data is always in some sense backward looking and it's reactionary. The data that we collect is always in reaction to something that is going on or a definition that has changed, right? The way that we define families have changed as families change, right? So it's always something that is ex post. So we have to then think about all of the things that we'd like to put into a long time um, span as being conditional on changes that are happening on the ground. So how do we actually anticipate those and how do those actually inform policy I think is important. Chai Cheng from the Center on Budget, thanks so much for both of your presentations <laughs> all the way back here. Um, in terms of trying to push federal agencies further on data collection and disaggregation and, and more on richer data, uh, do you see any sort of positive opportunities that are immediate? Because like in a lot of spaces, everything feels quite defensive right now. Um, census protecting it from the immigration question funding cuts across a lot of different um, agencies, and now uh, some concerns about actually reduced access to microdata because of uh, privacy concerns. So um, are there any positive things that you can suggest that we focus on or engage in, or is it mostly just building for the long term? <laughs> are you asking an economist to be optimistic? Um, <laughs> uh, I, to go back to a point that was raised earlier, I, um, they're not Obi-Wan Kenobi, but they really are our last hope at, at this time, um, would be the Federal Reserve simply because they have resources, significant resources, but they're a bit constrained into the questions that they might ask, but they might be very important, um, and they would have the resources to um, underwrite if the, um, if the board could be so convinced that this data is very important because they have um, more control over their resources than other um, than other institutions of data collection. And I, do agree that many of them are under assault just to collect the, the basic information that they are due. So this is not the time to say, turn to the Bureau of Labor Statistics um, for new data collection uh, efforts when many of their existing data collection efforts are, are being um, subjected to, to funding cuts. So it is, it is very difficult to get that data. States, however, in some states, are much more amenable to collecting this data or allowing this data to be shared. So states have a wide variety of administrative data and some states now are sharing more of their administrative data than ever before. So we may not have to necessarily reinvent the wheel as much as it is forming cooperative efforts to sort of dig around and, and resurrect the wheel or construct it from the parts 
that currently exist. And so there are some great resources in states that are much more open to researchers working with de-identified individual level data that might have some of those possibilities. Um, and the larger the state and the more heterogeneous the state, the better it's going to be. So I wouldn't necessarily put um, states that are relatively homogeneous at the top of the list, but those states tend to be the ones, I mean, it, it's sort of a perfect storm that states that are more heterogeneous tend to have larger data collection efforts, but also much more willing to let uh, social scientists and the policy community analyze that data. Um, I, I'm actually interested in speculating on that question from a, a campaign perspective. Um, I'm not familiar what like the existing campaigns are around data and data availability and data collection and usage, but it, it, it strikes me that um, you know, one very good angle that could be kind of like a, a unifying um, uh, kind of sort of campaign motivation is that, um, you know, at the same time that, that we're sort of losing the capacity to um, collect more, um, more and more and more meaningful data about ourselves that is publicly available and therefore available for the use um, for public, for the use for public good, um, there is an increasing amount of data that's being collected up by us, um, on us, against our will in some cases, or against our knowledge, and is being deployed in many ways against us, right, to extract our consumer dollars or to, you know, discriminate against us in various ways. So, um, you know, that's something that I think, you know, among the different things people are struggling with right now that might not float to the top, and it is very wonky, but there is a way, I think, to tell that story that could be very motivational and maybe build some movement around it. We'll take one more question and then we'll get to our next slide. Okay, I hope it's a good question. I'm, I'm nervous now. <laughs> Courtney Sanders, Storm Budget. Uh, my question is actually to the point you were making about homogeneous uh, states. I work with states like Maine and Nebraska, um, and they always ask me, well, Courtney, we have this black population, but we don't want to include all we don't want to just say it's black people because we know it's a lot of immigrants in this population, all these different things, and it's not statistically significant. And I was hoping from this conversation that we talk a little bit more about how we pull back that statistical significance piece on why it's important to talk about these very, very small 2%, 3% populations of race in these very homogeneous states, and how do we do that? Um, and I really like you didn't use as many data points as possible, but I understood your story and I understood the course of the story through the historical lens. And obviously that's something we offer, but if you had any comment to that, I would appreciate it. Could you repeat the question part of that? Sorry. <laughs> um, and it's for both of you, but how do we communicate and talk about the data in states that might be homogeneous, like all white states, Maine and Nebraska, when they're very small populations of color. Um, but we know that the programs and services that the state want to provide are trying to be targeted to those populations, even though they're so small. Um, I would say, so this is, this is, I'm from Massachusetts, so this is not my experience. But I would speculate that, um, you know, in that case, when the, if the data, if part of the, your premise is that the data simply isn't there or isn't really credible because of the sample sizes, that's a, a very good opportunity for, um, you know, grassroots kinds of organizing and research activities themselves. So, you know, we can, so one mode is to kind of rely on authoritative institutions to tell stories about us. And then the other mode is for us to be able to tell our own stories. And this is where, um, you know, this, this participatory action research comes into play, which is not, you know, something that I suggest lightly because it is very expensive and very hard to do well. But it is, you know, in this process, people who are, you know, affected by this particular issue come together to gather data about themselves and their own circumstances. Um, and they do so kind of with the support and guidance of people who are trained in kind of, you know, re research methods so that to kind of lend it some credibility for external observers. Um, and then, you know, and then actually not only um, the action part of it comes in the fact that because they are, they're, you know, actors in their own lives, they are in a position to kind of act immediately upon seeing this information that they are producing themselves. Um, and then, you know, and they're, thereby setting themselves up for be able to be able to measure their circumstance again at the end of the action and then proceed from there. So, um, you know, communities can be organized to generate their own data, right? And, it's, and there certainly might be some people who will um, poo-poo it because it isn't sort of, you know, official authoritative data. 
um, but it is information and it is actionable and relevant, then um, you know, that would be my recommendation. I think to, to piggyback uh, off of what you're, you're saying, if the group is that small, they should be highly likely to be targeted. You could really target them because you'd be able to count all of them, right? If it's a, you know, if it, the number is really, truly finite, then you really should be able to target them. And I think that the, one of the things that you might hear is this, it's really this conflation of statistical significance with general importance. And those are two very different uh, sorts of things. So in a place that is relatively small, you won't have a large N, but that is the N that exists, right? So statistical significance only matters if you're running a statistical test. And so if you're thinking about policy, that might not be, it might not have any um, say in the discussion or the policy discussion if you want to target, say, an immigrant population in Nebraska or an immigrant population in, in Maine um, for a specific um, resources, uh, it wouldn't matter. And so I think that when we were sort of confusing statistical power for measuring effects with targeting policies at a particular population. And so to one effect, to measure effects, it's actually a disadvantage to have a small N. But to actually target a population to be effective in terms of reaching that population, a small N is actually to your advantage. And so this is where discussion of policy actually has two different um, uh, uh, areas of, of need, which is if you know who you want to reach, you can reach them really relatively easily. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have a measurable effect um, in terms of the actual outcome. But if you're actually able to meet those people, as you're saying, they generate their own data, which can be very useful uh, for, for targeted populations. All right, great. Thanks. So now we will move into um, the part of our, our workshop where we sort of try to apply some of the things that we've talked about and, and heard about today. And specifically, I, I'm sure that many of us, maybe all of us, are engaged in social media in some way or another and see these various conversations and threads that <laughs> come up specifically related to race. Uh, some may be useful, others maybe not so much. But um, we, we had a few examples of things that we wanted to share and sort of work through these uh, specific questions uh, that Trevon identified. So we're gonna do that for part of the time. And then the other part of the time, uh, we're going to uh, have Sarah lead us in thinking about how we as researchers in, in the Washington DC community can help to um, compile, analyze data and information in a way that is more directly useful and applicable to various uh, campaigns and, and grassroots organizations across the country. So we're gonna try to get both of those two things done in our uh, remaining time. And given that, I'm going to be quiet and turn it over to our facilitator. Keeping, uh, I'll, I'll give you a moment to write these questions down because we're going to work through um, just some examples as an open-ended discussion, um, answering each of these questions and, and some things that we've captured um, specifically from Twitter. Uh, but to think about our answers to these uh, four questions. So the first is, how is race defined? And we're just going to see these tweets where people are talking about an issue that certainly has a racial component, but how is race defined? Is there any thinking about heterogeneity within the racial classification? Um, are we assuming a group or an average of individuals? Are we thinking, is implicitly what's behind this some sort of egocentric model? Or are we thinking about group uh, relations? And then how does that inform the interpretation we would have about uh, this outcome? So I'll leave that up for another um, minute before we get to, to the slides. Everyone ready? Okay, so um, Marianne Williamson <laughs> said, um, if you did the math of the 40 acres and a mule, given that there were four to five million slaves at the end of the Civil War, and they were uh, all promised 40 acres and a mule for every family of four, if you did the math today, it would be trillions of dollars. Reparations, big uh, truth, right? So who is she talking about in this 
in, in, this, in this tweet. Black, black people. Black people yeah. But now we go back to our census definition of black people. She's not just talking about black people, right? So when we think about, say, what um, the work that um, Darity and Hamilton were doing, she's putting this in the US descendants category strictly, right? But that certainly then is not all, that certainly is not all black people. Is that heterogeneity in this black population taken into account here in this discussion when she's talking about this dollar gap? So she is saying all, all, all black people are, are equivalent here in this discussion about, about reparations. And then third, is this egocentric or is this actually a group? And she's certainly applying a group analysis to them because she's putting them all in this group. Now she's putting people who are the descendants of slaves in a group with people who might be very recent immigrants to the United States in the same group. So then how does that inform the interpretation that we're giving to how she's structuring her argument about uh, reparations? I mean, there are no right or wrong answers, but you're, you're exactly, yeah, yeah. But, Thanks, yep. And so her trillions of dollars, the follow-up question would be, who does that apply to? And now we immediately have to go back to a question of, of race, right? So. We've certainly decided that she's not talking about um, Asians or other groups. She's talking about enslaved, um, enslaved uh, Africans. But then who would then be um, aiming to claim these reparations um, as this dollar value? Right. So even in discussions where she, she does not actually, so right to your point, she does not name black people here at all. But this discussion will certainly be framed in our popular media discussions in terms of race. And then will that heterogeneity in race actually be important in that, in that discussion? Um, and next we have um, student debt cancellation as proposed by Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders reduces racial wealth inequality, right? So the more debt cancellation uh, there is, the more racial wealth inequality is uh, reduced with this analysis of um, student debt and the racial wealth gap, right? So what races are we, uh, how is race defined here? Um, our implicit assumption is we don't, we don't know, or explicitly we don't know. Implicitly, if we're using data on student debt, that is largely going to be administrative data. So race would typically be defined the way that we have been talking about it in the discussion that we've had so far. Right? So these racial differences would not necessarily give rise to discussion of the heterogeneity that might exist among racial groups themselves in terms of the racial wealth gap. But this is framing the racial wealth gap as not a um, heterogeneous uh, difference within uh, races. And then are we thinking about groups? Or are we thinking about ego-centric um, models? This is a bit important, and right, these get commingled here because student debt is certainly observed at the individual level. And these differences in student debt rates would then be group averages of individuals belonging to that group. Right? So it might be a function of structural inequality but all of those things are here. And these tweets aren't necessarily a whole lot of uh, characters. But thinking about race in them becomes very complicated, just answering this very short set of questions about the implicit assumptions that are made there. And so when we think about this, if I tell you this is going to eliminate racial wealth inequality, it's going to eliminate racial wealth inequality to the extent that I make some other assumptions about the groups that would or would not have higher levels of student debt and who those people would be, because canceling out that debt may or may not exacerbate differences within the group, right? So all of these things are going on when we have this, uh, this analysis. Um, from Julian Castro, I was, th these are the examples that came uh, to me. I have some of my own. But all of these, I think, are really um, interesting. But this gets back to uh, um, thinking about or talking about economic research that then informs uh, people in the policy space. So economists Chetty and Hedren came out with a new study this year. It underlines um, what so many people knew intuitively Race is more important than class when determining futures. Even with economic status, racism still lingers. The two are inextricably linked in housing. 
So once again, this explicitly says race, but it doesn't define racial groups. But we know that Chetty and Hendren are using administrative data, so we're back to this traditional racial classification, which does not take account of heterogeneity within um, racial groups themselves. And then are we thinking when we say race and class, are we thinking about groups? And so we're saying race and class typically gets us thinking about groups. But remember the Chetty and, and Hedron papers are literally all individual level, right? They're linking parents to children and then aggregating that. This really is truly the aggregation of individuals belonging to specific uh, categories. And then how do we want to think about the interpretation of this, which then looks at housing policy as a source of intergenerational uh, mobility? So all of that is in this discussion of these results and that the New York Times and these great interactive maps that we can all go and play with and look at where we were born and see about the map of mobility, all of that actually has a whole lot of implicit um, assumptions about race that were not necessarily active when we're sort of thinking about them um, currently. And so um, this is another one. So um, Democrats like to talk about black Americans. And so here are some facts. Um, the black unemployment rate has been at or below 17% 7 uh, 7 for 17 straight months. Black poverty rate is at the lowest level in history. Black unemployment rate hit the lowest level ever recorded under Donald uh, Trump. Right? So we certainly know the racial group being talked about here are black Americans. Right? Um, we're not thinking about heterogeneity within um, this group. And these are citing um, facts about black economic uh, conditions at present. But is there something missing from this discussion about um, race? And so, There's no context. No. <laughs> but these are all sort of facts. And so when without that context about speaking about other races, we don't know how to even think about whether this is. It's, these all sound like great results until I say 7%. Well, what, are, what is the unemployment rate for any other group, which gets us back to how we traditionally would do racial analysis. There's no discussion of the black rate versus any other group, which then decontextualizes the black results as if they would be typical or that these results um, don't reflect any historical cumulative effects of sort of racial disadvantage as they might um, presume. And so this is um, one um, function of that. And so this is the last uh, example. Um, black ownership fell to 43% in 2017, virtually erasing all of the gains made since the passage of the Fair Housing Act in 1968. Um, landmark legislation outlawing housing discrimination, the heartbreaking decrease in um, black home ownership. So again, we have um, a, a black group where not, there's no discussion of heterogeneity um, within that group. Um, home ownership is an individual um, uh, outcome, but there's not a discussion of differences in home ownership rate to the places where geographically African Americans are more likely to be concentrated. That could be partly endogenous. If African Americans live in places with generally lower home ownership rates, they would have lower home ownership rates. But it is contextualizing African-American home ownership relative to itself in terms of 43% and going back to 1968. But similar to the previous tweet, it doesn't contextualize the home ownership rate of African-Americans relative to any other group, right? Whether that rate is 43% high or low compared to other groups. It turns out to be low, but it isn't um, contextualized here. So many of these discussions about race, when you go through that list of four questions, the interpretation that we have to whatever statistic and whatever um, political argument someone is trying to make hinges on the way that sort of race has been coded, but I think most important from these examples, hinges on a way in which we sort of instinctively react to racial discussions, right? So no one goes through, I would never tweet myself, I'm, you know, here's the outcome for, you know, black income, well, we all remember black is and give you the long definition because no one would want to read it or any other racial group. So the way that we talk about race typically um, is going off of essentially um, our own sort of intuitive knowledge about what race is. And that may or may not be the appropriate way for thinking about analytical descriptions of race and data that actually contains racial classifications. 
And so I think it's important for the policy community to think about that really deeply when we disseminate results, but also when we want to place those results in some sort of context. And so this result has a little bit more context than the previous slide, but both of them lack context in thinking about racial inequalities, right? So they're trying to say something about racial inequality, but it's very difficult to say that without any comparison group, whether we're talking about um, low uh, um, unemployment rates for African Americans or low home ownership rates um, for African Americans. And juxtapositioning these two tweets are things good for African Americans or actually bad for African Americans in the economy, right? So low home ownership rates, but low levels of, un of unemployment, right? So how do we actually um, want to think about that really depends on what outcomes that we're looking at. And that's multiple ways of thinking about, about race. Um, so you know, recent events, of course, make these examples relatively small, but they're part of the way that race is discussed day to day, particularly on um, social media as results um, come out. And so the way we discuss race really influences um, how we discuss race in moments that are particularly salient, right? And that would be moments, for example, um, that we've experienced in the last week or so. And so is there a difference in the way that we might discuss race in a policy discussion versus the way that we might discuss, say, race um, when there's been um, racial targeting or, or, or violence? And then what do those differences apply for how we're thinking um, about race, right? That I think that's actually some of the most important um, stuff we can get out of that. Well, um, my thought for this um, exercise was that when I go to these great panels and events, I um, usually have like a, an item in my like work plan, which is like, read my notes and follow up and, um, and, you know, and try to integrate it into my practice. And then sometimes it happens and more often it does not happen. So I thought it'd be great to, um, you know, one thing we could do here is uh, maybe kind of take some of those first steps towards just thinking about how some of these things show up in the work that you are going to go back to today and tomorrow and the rest of your life. So um, I, I, uh, the format here is that I have kind of a series of questions. Um, hopefully folks are like taking notes. So as I'm, re as I'm reading out the question, just kind of start jotting down your thoughts. If you don't know how to answer the question, that's a really good flag. Um, and I'll, so I'll get to the end of these questions and then we'll have some time for you to kind of turn to your partners and maybe share like, you know, what, uh, you know, what your thoughts are coming out of answering those questions and then maybe some details. And then at the end, we'll just have some like report backs from some of the tables. So if you want to share with the group, with the whole, whole group, you can. Um, so what is your area or your areas of research and specialty? Let's see, what do you focus on? Is it housing? Is it energy policy? Is it multiple? And um, that's an easy one. I hope you all know that. What are, what are the data sets that you work with regularly on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, yeah. <laughs> so maybe you have written down a few. Um, now, how far back do they go in years? What's the earliest year? Do you know what the earliest year is that that data was collected? Quick show of hands. If you know the answer to that question, could you raise your hand? You know how far back these go? OK, now keep your hands up. Now, do you know, do you also know um, whether, uh, so if now, sorry, so hands are, are up if you know your, um, how far it goes, how far back it goes. Second hand up if it goes back more than 100 years. <laughs> OK, probably very few. So now, for those of you who, um, probably for everyone actually, if you, if you had to go back beyond when your data started to be collected, do you know what other data is available? A different data set, another, another area where information was collected? Yeah. Um, so switching tracks, do you know the major historical moments that kind of changed that um, in, within your issue, what are the pivot points in history over the last hundred years, say? We're back to writing things down if you have, if you know the answer. Um, 
And finally, do you know, um, are you familiar with the full range of opportunities and limitations in this whole kind of set of data and our uh, data sets and multiple data sets um, that would enable us to reflect on history and the issue of the content of, the, of your issue, on the history of your issue, yes. Yes. Um, so do you know, are you familiar with the range of opportunities and limitations in using this data to reflect on that history within your issue? And especially reflecting on the multiple histories of that issue for different communities. A couple folks are still writing. All right, so you're, um, you can turn to your tables and other folks and if there are things you want to share, maybe you know the answers to all these questions and you want to show off a bit, or maybe <laughs> <laughs> you're wondering why don't I know this? Um, I'll stop you after maybe 90 seconds or 22 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> One mic so we can't talk. <laughs> we can't talk. I know it. <laughs> we can talk in code. <laughs> Like, um, have you ever compiled like a curriculum or resources or individuals who kind of um, are kind of leading the work in data disaggregation? Because I'd be really curious to kind of see who those folks are. Yeah, really yes, I think about it. It's kind of avant-garde, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you, you know, Sandy and, and there have, have done it and done it in the field, but a lot of people are just um, just using the data that exists. Right? I mean, we, we really are just data users. Make this point in the, in the discussion. Even our macroeconomic data, like GDP, and these don't mean the same things over time that they do. So we really don't have really good ideas about measurement. We have data, we want to measure communities. So the people who are doing the disaggregation are always thinking about new data. But when we think about anything historical, we have to go back and disaggregate the old data. How do we do that? And, and it, it's just really, really hard. Even as people <coughs> want to link people back to historical census records, who links is a function of being able to be found. I mean, they're fully linked. You can't make these things. You can't do the burdens of the past in this thing. So it's really hard. But I think, particularly, there are people in, in social science who've been thinking about, say, segregation and, and other issues who've been doing a lot of work in that, in that space. Okay, everyone. In a couple seconds, we can come back. 
<laughs> I know, once you let them go. All right. I'm going to have to resort to organizer earning. If you can hear, if you can hear me clap once. If you can hear me clap twice. OK, we don't have to go third time. Um, OK, so I hope you're having great conversations about what you know and what you wish you knew. Um, does anyone want to share? Does anything great come up in your group that you just want to share with everybody? Or that you feel like you ought to share with everybody, even if you don't want to? Yeah, there you go. So I shared some of my information. So I look at racial and economic disparities. I use data from the census IPUMS or IPUMS, which I love. If you want to know about it, please come and talk to me. It's like the best data set ever. I also use data set from Project Hale. Um, the census data set starts in 1790. I don't know how I can get data before 1790. It'd be great <laughs> if I did. Um, historical events that happened, uh, I think it was like the one, two, three, four, fifth question. Mm -hmm. My response was lynchings and civil war. Mm -hmm. So again, I look at lynchings and voting. So those are the two historical events that have happened. And then uh, limitations is that I wish that my lynching data set started earlier. So it starts in 1882 and ends in 1930. It would be great if I just had lynchings from the first slave being brought over here. That would be great. Also, it'd be great if I had voting data between, say, like the 1870s and 1970, just to kind of fill in those links. Awesome. Thank you so much. Am I still on here? Yeah, I think so. Um, do others want to share? So actually, I didn't get to share this with the group because we didn't have time. Um, so I do. Um, well, I shared some. I, I work on um, economic security issues and retirement security, usually with a racial and ethnic uh, lens, and I focus on um, the racial wealth gap in particular. Um, I typically co-author documents. I do the historical research part, and so I'm not focusing on a specific data set. Um, my um, co-authors use um, PSID, CPS, um, SIP, with the historical data that I that I use, I I mean I just research extensively wherever I can find the information. So, for example, um, the looking at the racial wealth gap in Washington D.C., I went to the inception of D.C. and read historical documents on how policies and institutional practices created wealth for whites and and um, created barriers or stripped wealth from from African Americans. All right, so there's one last pair of questions that, um, oh, but so for those of you who do, who did know the answers to all those questions, um, that's great, You're, you don't have any homework. Um, for those who don't, I mean, I can't make you do anything, obviously, but I hope that you'll go back and kind of take a look at, um, you know, what are some of the resources that will help us tell more histories. Um, so the second pair of questions for our last kind of small group discussion is just kind of a little bit of a reflection um, on two sides of this sort of partnership and you know this role in, in making change, which is um, from your for your organization or you personally, um, what are the what are the practices that you have in trying to make your the research that you do your work um, actionable and accessible for people who are doing work on the ground on this issue today. And, um, and then the second question is, from your perspective, what are the things that you wish that those groups on the ground do, uh, like, like my group, like campaign or movement groups, what do you wish that they would do um, to ask for support in a, in a way that will help you give it, provide it? Yeah, little time to think about it. So, 
If you can wrap up your thoughts, a couple seconds. All right. So I feel like um, I feel like these last two questions that I posed could really deserve their whole workshop or like a whole day or just a lot more time than we have, unfortunately. So um, if you know, folks, folks can, um, if there's anyone who has something like really juicy that you want to share right now, then we can maybe do one or two. Otherwise, I hope that like, you can, um, if you have something that you want to share you, and you're good to share it, like, email it to me. Um, I do compile these things and, and try to act on them. So you know, as someone who is often trying to get work from people. So um, does anyone want, have something you want to share just quickly? Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you. Others? Maybe one more? Earlier in the process, like I think a lot of times we have a case come to us and they want a very specific number, so I know that is. And they want it today. Tomorrow, <laughs> and the, the tomorrow is hard enough, but he's not offering the specific number. And instead of the specific number, I think, what, what do you get next? What, what is the argument you're trying to make more broadly? Because we can almost never deliver the exact number that is the thing the thing people wanted in the argument. You can deliver something really close. Um, and we don't ever want to say no, but if you know, if the demand is for a specific number, then that's much harder. So I think getting in early so we can have an understanding of a strategic position of the campaign and figure out what we can actually deliver that will help it, rather than just being sort of a, a late negotiation number that they can reach. Thank you. Yeah. It's a very specific job title. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Great. Well, so thanks everybody. I mean, it, again, this is something, this notion, this, this, you know, how do we work better together to make things happen is very, very near and dear to my heart as someone who kind of sits at the, you know, the cusp of the realm of organizers and the realm of researchers. So if you are interested in this and have thoughts, then please come find me after the thing goes off the air. And, yeah, let's go ahead and give them a <laughs> So I want to thank everyone for sticking around with us today. I hope that this was useful um, and productive. This actually is like the perfect bridge to our next workshop, which will be on building um, effective partnerships between research organizations and uh, I forget the specific title, but generally groups focused on uh, racial justice. So that will be the entire focus of our next workshop, which I believe is scheduled for September 26th, which is a Thursday. So the next time we'll be meeting on a Thursday instead of a Wednesday. And as you know, I'll send around a reminder um, and also we'll include links to the videos for today's workshop as well as the previous workshop. Um, does anyone have any final questions, thoughts, or comments before we adjourn? Yes, absolutely. I can share that as well. All right. Well, thank you. Great. How do we get these things off? <laughs>